Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of this channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, both of those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here and enjoy what you're hearing or have been here and not done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does this help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases. Right after this intro, an ad will play. And before I read the first case, an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, some of these cases contain material not suitable for all. Listing discretion is advised. Travion Shaquille Ross behind bars for the gas station attack that led to the death of David Ray Young. Travion Jaquil Ross is behind bars for the gas station attack in Houston, Texas that led to the death of David Ray Young. In 2020, Ross was in his recently purchased 2010 Blue Mitsubishi Lancer when he pulled out of a gas station in the 400 block of FM 1960. It was during that time that he collided with Young's vehicle, a 2011 Black Lincoln, MKZ XXX, according to the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Surveillance footage captured Young exiting his vehicle to exchange information with Ross in the parking lot. That's when Ross punched him in the face, which caused him to fall to the ground. Officials stated that Young laid unconscious. Ross repeatedly stomped and kicked him. Police officers from the Harris County Sheriff's Office arrived on the scene and Young was transported to an area hospital by ambulance. The beating left Young paralyzed from the neck down, and he was confined to a wheelchair as a quadriplegic. His elderly mother cared for him for two years until his death on November 28, 2022. Young died of complications due to his injuries. He was only 56 years old. Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg said, This was an unnecessary and unreasonable response to a small disagreement. The victim's family has suffered the loss of a loving father and son. While we have achieved justice, the family will never see their loved one again. Ross was arrested and later convicted of murder. In August 2023, he was sentenced to 58 years in prison. Assistant District Attorney Moran Kutani stated that Ross and Young did not know each other. He went on to say that the defendant's short temper and history of assaulting others threaten our community. It's clear that he tends to use his hands as a weapon. We believe the jury made the right decision in giving an appropriate sentence to ensure the safety of our community. Ross must complete half of his sentence before becoming eligible for parole. Andres Martina behind bars for the sledgehammer murder of his 12-year-old grandson, Andre Smith. Andres Martina is behind bars for murdering his 12-year-old grandson, Andre Smith, inside his home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In May 2012, Martina, then 53, moved back to Milwaukee from Indiana and wanted to reconnect with his grandchildren, Andre and his 8-year-old brother. On August 28, 2021, they spent the night at his house near 46th and Glendale and he had planned to take them shopping for school supplies. The following morning, at around 3 a.m., Martina said he noticed his wallet was open and missing money. He automatically assumed it was Andre because of his alleged problem with stealing. When he confronted Andre in the living room area, he said he smacked him repeatedly because he didn't know what else to do to get his grandson to give him back his money. According to the complaint, 
Andre ran to the bathroom and locked himself in in an attempt to protect himself from his grandfather. After Martina picked the lock open, he lost it on Andre. The commotion awakened Martina's disabled mother, who watched on as he attacked Andre and his brother. Investigators stated that the attack lasted more than five hours and that Martina used multiple objects to beat Andre, including a mallet, a coat rack, and a cane. Martina later sent a text message to Andre's grandmother and told her that he had stolen from him. When she asked about his whereabouts, his only reply was that he was bleeding, according to TMJ4. That's when she informed Andre's mother to go to Martina's house to find out what was going on. When she and her boyfriend arrived, they found Andre unconscious. Her other son was suffering from a head laceration, a fractured finger, and bruising. They transported the boys to an area hospital, where Andre was pronounced dead about 45 minutes later. According to the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, Andre died from a severe skull fracture. During a search of Martina's home, they found marijuana, methamphetamine pills, and a firearm. Martina was arrested and booked into the county jail, where he was held on a $750,000 cash bond. He was charged with five felony counts, including first-degree intentional homicide, child abuse, and possession of a firearm by a felon. During an interview with detectives, Martina mentioned that he had served time in prison for murdering a boy in 1989. He also stated that he was well aware of what he was doing when he beat his grandson. He added that he recalled telling his grandson, If you lie, if you mess up in school, if you steal, I'm going to kill you. During Martina's first court appearance, his daughter, who was Andre's mother, spoke. She told the court commissioner that my dad hurt me my whole life. I loved him because he was my dad. I was going to give you a chance, man. She then turned to her father, Martina, and said, I warned you. I begged you to stay away from my kids. I will never, ever forgive you or her mom for what you did to my baby. Andre didn't deserve what you did to him. I hope wherever you go, they do to you what you did to my baby. I hate you. Martina later tried to use self-defense. He testified that Andre pulled a gun on him. When he grabbed the gun from him, he said, he swung into the wall, hit his head on the wall, and that's the only thing I remember. Prosecutors stated that Andre's injuries were too extensive for Martina to claim self-defense. In September 2001, Martina pleaded not guilty to the charges. Martina later apologized in court. He said, I'm profoundly sorry that I wasn't able to control my panic and anxiety. In May 2022, Martina was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide and attacking Andre's younger brother. Milwaukee County Judge Stephanie Rothstein said, This is the most, one of the most, I wish I could say the most. One of the most aggravated homicides I've dealt with, and I've been in this area of practice for almost 38 years. The following month, Martina was sentenced to two life sentences with an additional 23 years in prison. His defense team said he is planning to appeal his conviction. Christopher Vaughn, behind bars for the roadside murders of his wife, Kimberly, and their three children. Christopher Vaughn is behind bars for murdering his wife, Kimberly, and their three children, Abigail, Cassandra, and Blake, inside their sports utility vehicle in Will County, Illinois. On June 14, 2007, law enforcement officers were dispatched to a service road near Interstate Highway 55, in Chanahan Township, about 40 miles southwest of Chicago. When they arrived on the scene, they found Kimberly, 34, dead inside the family's red 
Ford Expedition. Her body was in the passenger seat, and she had been shot once in the head. Authorities also found her children, Abigail, 12, Cassandra, 11, and Blake, 8, shot in the back seat. Each child had been shot twice. Christopher sustained superficial gunshot wounds to his leg and arm, and he was transported to the St. Joseph Medical Center in Joliet, where detectives met him for questioning. He told detectives that he and his family, originally from Missouri, left their home in Oswego before dawn. They were on their way to a water park in Springfield. It was supposed to be a surprise trip, but they never made it. Christopher, a then 32-year-old computer security consultant, pulled the vehicle over when his wife said she was feeling sick. According to the Chicago Tribune, when they were on the side of the road, Christopher got out of the vehicle with the intention of fixing the luggage rack. But when he noticed the blood on his leg, he panicked. Christopher limped away from the SUV and flagged down a passing motorist for help. When Christopher learned he was suffering from multiple gunshot wounds, he claimed to have had no memory of how it occurred, nor did he remember hearing gunshots. He later asked if authorities had informed his wife about the shooting. At the scene, detectives found a 9mm semi-automatic handgun belonging to Christopher. He brought it in Washington State, where he and his family lived just before moving to Illinois in May 2006. When Christopher was discharged from the hospital, he went to the Illinois State Police District 5 offices, where detectives questioned him further. He was not considered a suspect in the case. Therefore, when the interrogation was over, he left on his own free will, police said. Christopher later became the prime suspect when they interviewed multiple witnesses and ascertained incriminating evidence on his computer and phone records. Evidence at the scene also suggested that Christopher was the shooter. Investigators said they used DNA analysis to examine blood splatter patterns and have also looked at bullet trajectories and gunpowder residue. An investigation led police officials to believe that Christopher put the gun under Kimberly's chin and shot her. He then fatally shot Abigail and Cassandra while they were sleeping. It was reported that he shot Blake as he was raising his hand in an effort to protect himself from the bullet. On June 23rd of that same year, officers arrested Christopher at a funeral home in St. Charles, Missouri, just hours before the memorial service for Kimberly and her children began. Christopher was initially held at the St. Charles Detention Center, where he was isolated from the other inmates until he was extradited to Illinois. When he arrived in Illinois, Christopher was booked into the Will County Jail, where he was held without bond and placed on suicide watch. He was charged with eight counts of first-degree murder, two for each person he killed. The dispatch reported that the following month, Christopher was indicted on four counts of first-degree murder. Four of the eight first-degree murder counts were dropped. In July 2007, he pleaded not guilty to the charges. During a hearing in September 2007, Christopher learned that prosecutors would pursue the death penalty if he were to be found guilty. He apparently showed no emotion after hearing the announcement. During the trial, which lasted nearly six weeks, Christopher's defense team said he was innocent of the crimes and that Kimberly was the shooter. A private investigator stated that Christopher remembered what happened. He said Kimberly shot and killed their children before turning the gun on herself. Christopher articulated that he was standing outside the car when he heard the gunshots. When he re-entered the vehicle, Kimberly shot him twice, then told him, you killed the kids, before fatally shooting herself. According to his defense team, Kimberly had become unstable from a shifting blend of medications, including some linking to increased in violent and suicidal behavior. Prosecutors contended that Christopher was the shooter, 
They stated that after he pulled the SUV over, he exited the vehicle, retrieved his gun from the rack on the roof, and put it in his jacket. After getting back in the car, he shot and killed his wife and children. It is their belief that Christopher murdered his family so that he could escape to Canada and live in the wilderness. In September 2012, a Will County jury deliberated for less than an hour before finding Christopher guilty of fatally shooting his family. In a statement, Will County State's Attorney said, in the successful prosecution of Christopher Vaughn, we called 90 witnesses to the state in our case in chief, and the jury returned a guilty verdict in 60 minutes. That same year in November, Christopher was sentenced to four consecutive life terms with no chance of parole. Christopher's attorneys are reportedly still trying to prove his innocence. Corita Beavers behind bars for the murder of her boyfriend, Tabeo Parker. Corita Beavers is behind bars for murdering her boyfriend, Tabeo Parker, of nearly three years during an argument outside their home in Summit County, Ohio. On the morning of January 9, 2016, Beavers and her boyfriend, along with two others, left their home in Akron and walked to the corner store to purchase beer. On their way home, Beavers and Parker, who allegedly had a volatile relationship, got into a heated argument, according to WYMT. The people they were walking with had gone ahead of them. When they reached an area near Weehawken Place and Dahlgren Drive, police officials believed that Beavers told Parker she was going to kill him before she pulled out a gun and opened fire. She shot at him three times, but one of the bullets struck him in the chin and traveled to his brain. Witnesses reported seeing someone driving a gray car down the street after hearing gunshots. When first responders arrived on the scene, they found Parker laying on the sidewalk with a 22 caliber handgun beneath him. A firearms analysis from the Bureau of Criminal Investigation later confirmed that it was the same gun used to shoot Parker. Paramedics transported Parker to Akron City Hospital, where the 22-year-old succumbed to his injuries the following day, January 10, 2016. Police officials stated that when Parker's relatives learned of his shooting, one of them attacked Beavers. She sustained injuries and was taken to the hospital. It was there that investigators ascertained that she had a blood alcohol level of .338 more than four times the legal limit in the state of Ohio. When she was released from the hospital, detectives questioned her for three hours, during which time she maintained her innocence. Beaver's attorney argued that she did not kill Parker and that it was a possibility he committed suicide, but the medical examiner's office had ruled his death as a homicide. He also claimed that the shooter could have been one of the occupants in the gray car. Despite his efforts, law enforcement officials arrested Beavers on charges of one count of murder, felony murder, and felonous assault. She was booked into the Summit County Jail. During the trial, Beavers' attorney called the investigation botched because he said the police found no gunshot residue on Beavers' clothes or hands, nor her DNA on the gun that shot Parker. Corita Beavers was scientifically excluded from committing this crime. At the end of the trial, I am firmly convinced we will all be asking ourselves why we are here in the first place, said Beavers' attorney. Prosecutors contended that Beavers being the shooter was the most logical explanation, as she was the only person with Parker at the time of the shooting. On November 23, 2016, a Summit County jury deliberated for two days before they found Beavers guilty of second-degree murder with a firearm specification and felonious assault with a firearm specification. The following month, Beavers was sentenced to life in prison. I am pleased my office was able to secure justice for this victim and his family, the judge said in a statement. 
I will continue to aggressively prosecute gun violence in our community. Beavers will be eligible for parole after serving 18 years. In June 2018, Beavers filed an appeal, but the Summit County Court of Common Pleas upheld her conviction. Susan Powell, Utah woman still missing. Who was Susan Powell? Susan Marie Powell, 28, seemed to have it all. She was a full-time broker at Wells Fargo and had a young family with two little boys, ages two and four. Her husband seemed to adore her and the children. However, on December 6, 2009, Susan Powell vanished and police began to suspect Susan's life was not what it had appeared. Marriage to Josh Powell. Susan was raised in Puyallup, Washington. She was 18 years old and a cosmetology student when she met Josh Powell. He was 25. According to the All That's Interesting, Josh and Susan were devoted members of the Church for Latter-day Saints and enrolled in an Institute of Religion course. Josh proposed to Susan just days after she met him. They married on April 6, 2001 at the LDS Portland, Oregon Temple. The couple moved in with Josh's father, Stephen, in South Hill, close to Pouliat. During that time, Stephen would sexually harass Susan, even regularly stealing her underwear. Stephen also secretly filmed Susan for a year until he confessed in 2003. When confronted by Susan, Josh sided with his father, causing great contention in the relationship. Susan was ecstatic when they moved to West Valley City, Utah in 2004. However, Susan did not know that Josh had been very possessive in his previous relationship with Catherine Everett. Everett claims she felt she had to flee the state to get away from Josh because of his obsessive behavior. Susan gave birth to her first son, Charles, in 2005 followed by her second son, Brayden, in 2007. She focused on her children and her new career as a broker. Meanwhile, Josh was between jobs but liked to spend, causing even more agitation in the relationship. In 2007, Josh filed for bankruptcy with more than $200,000 in debt. What happened that day? On December 6, 2009, Susan went to church with her children. A neighbor stopped by that afternoon and would be the last person to see Susan at around 5 p.m. The following morning, she failed to show up at work, and her children did not attend daycare. The daycare staff could not reach Susan or Josh, so they decided to call Susan's mother, who called the police. Detective Elias Maxwell of the West Valley City Police Department went to Susan's home and saw what appeared to be Susan's belongings, and there were no signs of forced entry or an altercation. He noted that two fans were blowing on a wet spot on the carpet. Josh arrived home with the children at 5 p.m. and claimed to have been gone on an overnight camping trip with the kids. Both children agreed that's where they had been. The police interrogated Josh Powell. He claimed he had gone camping the night before with the children. However, Josh could not explain why Susan's cell phone was found inside his car, along with the generator, tarps, gas canisters, and shovels. Investigators asked who would take their children camping on a school night with freezing temperatures and mixed rain and snow. While the police were processing the minivan, Josh rented a car on December 8th and drove 800 miles before returning the car to Salt Lake City Airport on December 10th. The rental had no GPS data for police to know where it had been driven. On December 9th, investigators found blood containing Susan's DNA on their carpet. And on December 15th, they found her written documents in her safety deposit box. Investigators searched the campsite where Josh said he had been, but could not determine if the spot had been used recently. After Josh returned home, neighbors were questioned, 
and one told police that Josh had been acting unusual. His hands were badly windburned, and he was putting a lot of lotion on them. Other neighbors stated Susan was very unhappy in her marriage and had spoken openly about divorcing him. One of Susan's friends told the police she had been saving money to leave. Josh's Movement During a media interview in November 2010, Josh told the reporter that his wife was mentally unstable and he thought she left on her own and possibly with another man. Susan's family and Josh's sister disputed this, but Josh's father supported his son's statement to the police. Initially, after Susan disappeared, her family supported Josh, but a month after Susan's disappearance in January 2010, Josh packed up his family and moved back to Puliop, Washington. He told family members he was leaving to avoid the constant news coverage. Josh moved back in with his father, Stephen Powell, and cut off all communication with Susan's family, including her parents, Chuck and Judy Cox. Another man? There was widespread speculation that Susan's disappearance was connected to the December 12, 2009 disappearance of Stephen Kosher, a former journalist. Stephen left his home in St. George approximately four hours from West Valley City and was last seen in Nevada. He still remains missing. Susan and Kosher were about the same age and vanished within days of each other, so authorities began investigating if the two cases were linked. Josh told others the two had run away together, possibly traveling to Brazil, where Kosher had gone on a mission trip. However, authorities could not find any connection and had no proof they even knew each other. The theory was ruled out. Voyeurism In September 2011, Stephen Powell was arrested and charged with possession of child pornography and voyeurism. When investigators searched his home for evidence connected to Susan's disappearance, they found more than 1,000 videos of women and young girls being filmed without their knowledge. Some videos showed victims using the toilet, showering, and taking baths. He had made video diaries in which he smelled Susan's underwear and went on and on about his love for her. Investigators said it appeared Stephen had been peeping on victims for at least a decade. Recommended Stephen went as far as taping Susan's head onto photographs of women's nude bodies, along with pictures of him masturbating to a video of Susan. In May 2012, Stephen was convicted of 15 charges and sentenced to two years in prison. In Susan's journal, she wrote that she thought Stephen was a pedophile and ultimately a bad influence on Josh. Murder, suicide. Susan and Josh's two children were placed in foster care following Stephen's arrest. The Coxes acquired temporary custody of them. Josh was given supervised visitation twice a week and underwent a psychological exam in his effort to regain custody. He also rented a new home. The psychologist diagnosed Josh with a narcissistic personality and pointed out that while he was an attentive and affectionate parent, he would regularly say inappropriate things to his sons about Susan's family, despite being told not to. According to the Charlie Project, Josh also believed a militant faction of LDS had plans to kidnap the children. Josh told the children that the Mormon police had placed Stephen in jail on fabricated charges and were trying to put Josh in jail too. He denied any interest in pornography and rejected having any knowledge of pornographic images on his father's computer. Investigators in Utah found approximately 400 cartoons and images with incestuous themes on Susan and Josh's computer in 2009, but investigators in Washington were not aware of this until November of 2011. It is now believed the images were from the previous owner of the computer, as Susan had purchased it secondhand from another LDS member. Regardless, the judge ordered Josh to undergo a polygraph test and psychosexual evaluation before being considered to regain his parental rights. 
The following weekend, on February 5, 2012, Josh had a visitation with his sons. He let the boys in the house but locked the door so the state caseworker could not enter. He then attacked the children with a hatchet before dousing them with gasoline and setting the house on fire, killing himself and his two boys, five and seven years of age. Josh left messages for his family and attorney apologizing for what he did, but none even mentioned his wife. Investigators say Josh had planned the murder-suicide and had stored gasoline. He even gave all the boys his belongings away before murdering them. Both children were buried at Woodbine Cemetery in Puliap, Washington. Of course, you all know I try to keep my personal opinions out of these cases, but I think you know what I'm getting ready to say. Fuck this guy. He could have killed himself and not the children. Anyway, let's get back to the case. Unsealed Document In March 2012, unsealed court documents revealed additional evidence tying Josh to Susan's disappearance and potential murder. Her blood was found on the tile floor next to the couch, and her cell phone was in Josh's car. When Josh turned over his and Susan's cell phones to investigators, the SIM memory cards were missing. Josh had taken out a $1.5 million life insurance policy on Susan. Soon after her disappearance, Josh accessed her retirement account and canceled Susan's upcoming doctor's appointment. Josh's son, Charlie, told the authorities that Susan had been with them on the camping trip the night she vanished, but she did not return with them, and he did not know why. My mom stayed at Dinosaur National Park. My mom stayed where the crystals are, Charlie told investigators. Several weeks after Susan disappeared, Charlie also told his teacher that his mother was dead. Accomplice Near the first anniversary of the boys' murder, Josh's brother, Michael Powell, committed suicide by jumping off the roof of a parking garage at the apartment where he lived in Minnesota in February of 2013. Michael had been battling Susan's parents over the $2 million life insurance policy Josh had taken out on himself and his sons. Josh had designated Michael as the primary beneficiary. The Coxes disputed it in court, and the insurance company refused to distribute the funds until the matter was settled in court. After Michael died, authorities disclosed they believed Josh was responsible for Susan's disappearance and that Michael helped his brother cover it up. Michael had sold his car to a salvage yard in Oregon two weeks after Susan vanished. He later ordered satellite images of the lot where the car was left. When investigators found the car, a cadaver dog indicated a decomposing body had been in the trunk. Michael and Josh communicated using a computer code that authorities could not crack, but they were convinced Michael had helped Josh get rid of Susan's body. Their father, Stephen, died of natural causes in a Washington hospital in July 2018 at the ripe old age of 68. Outstanding Loss The Cox family not only lost their precious daughter, but they also lost both of their grandchildren. The loss is immeasurable, and the case is haunting. Susan's parents scrutinized the police investigation into their daughter's disappearance especially after Charlie and Brandon's death. They believed there was more than enough evidence to make an arrest and ultimately prevent the murders from happening. In July 2020, the court ordered the State Department of Social and Health Services to pay Chuck and Judy $98 million for negligence resulting in the deaths of their grandchildren. It was a win but wouldn't bring their daughter and grandsons back. Chuck Cox says he intends to use the money to honor his late grandchildren. Chuck and Judy stated they wanted to try to help others so they can save more children. The Pike County Massacre. Eight family members murdered in Ohio. Grizzly Crime Scene in Ohio The 911 call at 7.49 a.m. on April 22, 2016 
Bobby Joe Manley used a key to enter the home on Union Hill Road and arrived to find a scene of unspeakable horror that launched the largest and most expensive criminal investigation in Ohio history. Discovery of the Bodies The morning started with Bobby Joe visiting the home to feed some pets for family members who lived in rural Piketon in Pike County, Ohio. There, she found the blood-soaked bodies of Christopher Roden Sr., her former brother-in-law and Christopher's cousin, Gary Roden. There's blood all over the house, she screamed to the 911 dispatcher. Over the course of the morning, police and family members discovered four more bodies in two adjacent homes. At 1.26 p.m., a man called to report that he had found the body of his cousin, Kenneth Roden, the eighth and final victim. Kenneth lived about a 10-minute drive away from the other victims. All eight victims had been shot at close range while sleeping. A toddler and two babies, one of whom was only four days old, were found unharmed at the crime scenes. The four-day-old infant had been sleeping next to her mother in bed while her mother was murdered and was covered in her mother's blood. Almost all of the victims were members of the Roden family. Christopher Roden Sr., 40 years old. Dana Roden, 37, ex-wife of Christopher Sr. Clarence Frakey Roden, 20, elder son of Dana and Christopher Sr. Christopher Roden Jr., 16, younger brother of Frankie. Kenneth Roden, 44, brother of Christopher Sr. Gary Roden, 44, cousin of Christopher Sr. and Kenneth. Hannah Hazel Gilly, 20, fiance of Frankie and mother of one of the babies found at the scene. Hannah Mae Roden, 19, daughter of Christopher Sr. and Dana, mother of four-day-old infant found next to her body. Hannah also had a four-year-old daughter who was not present at the shooting. Investigation begins. It was clear from the beginning that investigators would need a large task force to handle a crime of this enormity. The Ohio Bureau of Investigation was brought in, as well as the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Administration. Authorities immediately suspected that there were more than one killer involved due to the elaborate nature of the killings and the fact that three different guns were used in the shootings. Initially, they believed that drug cartels had shot the victims because of the presence of a grow house to cultivate cannabis plants found at one of the crime scenes. Some members of the Roden family had been raising chickens for cockfighting, which provided authorities with another potential motive. However, other signs seemed to point to perpetrators who were known to the Rodens. There were no signs of forced entry, and the manner in which the killings were carried out seemed to suggest that the killers were familiar with the Rodens and their properties. Also, Dana Rodens' two pit bulls were known to be fiercely protective of the family, but the dogs were left unharmed. Hundreds of tips flooded in to the authorities over the course of the investigation. On October 2016, then Attorney General Mike DeWine and then Pike County Sheriff Charles Reeder were publicly stated that they believed the killers were local, known to the victims and not part of any cartel. DeWine called the murders the most important case going on in the state. The Suspects by 2017, after looking closer to home for suspects, authorities began to focus on one family member in particular. DeWine and Reeder asked the public for more information on the Wagner family, who were local to Pike County but had moved to Alaska after the murders. Four members of the Wagner family were of interest to authorities. Angela Wagner, George Billy Wagner III, George Wagner IV, older son of Angela and George III. Edward Jake Wagner, younger son of Angela and George III and former boyfriend of Hannah Mae Roden, one of the victims. Jake and Hannah were the parents of a young daughter who had been staying with their father during the shootings. Arrests After gathering enough evidence to build a strong case against them, 
police arrested all four Wagners in November of 2018. All the evidence collected to build the case proved that the Wagners had developed a detailed and elaborate plot to eliminate the rodents, including buying ammunition, constructing a homemade silencer, and tampering with phones, cameras, and security systems. Police also arrested two additional family members, Rita Newcomb, Angela Wagner's mother, and Frederica Wagner, Billy Wagner's mother. Both were charged with perjury and obstructing justice for lying to authorities. The charges against Wagner's were eventually dismissed. Trial, guilty pleas, sentencing. Rita Newcomb and Angela Warner pleaded guilty in exchange for testifying against other family members. Jake Wagner admitted to shooting five of the eight victims, including the mother of his child, while his father killed the remaining victims. After prosecutors agreed to take the death penalty off the table for him and his family, he pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against his father and brother. In September 2021, he was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. George Wagner IV pleaded not guilty and his case went to trial. His mother and brother testified that he was involved in planning the murders and covering them up, and went along with his father and brother to the shootings, although he didn't actually kill any of the victims. He was found guilty of eight counts of aggravated murder and in December of 2022 was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences. After numerous delays, the trial of George Billy Wagner III is scheduled for 2024. Catherine Knight, the female Hannibal Lecter who ate her husband. Catherine Knight, a real-life monster. Catherine was born in 1955 in Tenterfield, New South Wales, as a twin with a sister, Joy. Her mother, Barbara, and father, Ken Knight, already had four boys and a dysfunctional family. Catherine's father was an alcoholic and very abusive. Catherine dropped out of school at age 15, landed a job at a slaughterhouse, and was given a set of butcher knives. She was soon promoted to a boning position. Later, put them to good use in her life, murdering, skinning, and cooking her partner, John Price. Cannibal Killers While cannibal killers are rare, several notable cases have occurred throughout the years. This rarity makes it extremely difficult to analyze their crimes. Although most cannibal killers have been men, there are documented cases of female killers. Catherine would be the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life without parole in Australia. Along with the orders was a notation, never to be released. Frontiers in Psychology identified common traits found in cannibal killers. Older than average murders, usually not related to the victims. Brain abnormalities present. Low social and economic status. Abandonment as a child. A need to dominate their victims. Grew up in an abusive environment. Dr. Eric Hickey, professor of forensic psychology at Walden University, said that for cannibals, eating their victim gives them ultimate power. Catherine Knight's Abusive Relations In 1973, Catherine met David Kellett, whom she married in 1974. At the time, Catherine's mother advised him, you better watch out for this one or she'll kill you. Sure enough, on their wedding night, Catherine attempted to strangle David. It didn't take long before she was pregnant, and one night, she burned all his clothes and slammed him in the head with a frying pan. Their daughter, Melissa, was born in 1976, shortly before David walked out of the marriage because of the abuse by Catherine. While walking the baby in a stroller, swinging it to and fro, neighbors called the police, who took her to St. Elmo's Hospital, where she was kept for several days. 
After her release, she took her baby to the train station and laid her on the tracks. Fortunately, a man saw what happened and grabbed the baby and called police. Again, she was arrested and placed in a psychiatric hospital. She was released into the care of David and his mother. In 1980, they had another daughter, Natasha. A few years later, attempting to show David what she would do to him if he cheated, she grabbed a two-month-old puppy and slit its throat. Unbelievably, in 1988, they had a third daughter, Sarah. Catherine and David also bought a house, which she decorated with animal skins, skulls, horns, and animal traps. Meanwhile, the violence continued. Catherine hit David in the face with an iron and then stabbed him with scissors, forcing David out of the house and into hiding. By 1990, Catherine had taken up with John Collingsworth, and a year later, their son Eric was born. This lasted for three years until 1995 when she moved in with John Price, called Pricey by his friends. John was a hard worker and well-liked by many friends and co-workers. Catherine moved in with John in 1995. Last Dinner with John Price in 1998, Catherine pushed for John to marry her, but he refused. In retaliation, she took a video of things he had taken from his work and showed the video to his boss, who immediately fired him, though he had 17 years with the company. In the year of 2000, John took out a restraining order and told his co-workers, if I don't show up tomorrow, it's because Catherine killed me. When he didn't show up the next day, his boss sent a worker to find him. The police were called and found his body, with Catherine passed out next to him. One officer later said, By the time I got to the scene, Catherine was leaving in an ambulance. She had taken some pills. Not enough to kill her, but they made her sleepy. While Catherine was taken to the hospital, the coroner took John to the morgue. As the police searched the home, they found skin hanging from the top of a doorway to the bottom, almost a full human body's skin. Two placemats were set at the table with meat and vegetables on the plate. On the stove was John's head cooking in a pot with more vegetables. There were a number of slices of rump taken off of his human rump, baked in the oven with some vegetables and put on plates with the name of two of his children on them. The autopsy report showed John had been stabbed 37 times with chunks of his flesh missing. When questioned, Catherine said she couldn't remember what happened. Psychiatrists deemed her fit for trial. It was set for October 2001 when Catherine pled guilty. Never to be released. At the end of her trial, the judge declared, I'm satisfied beyond any doubt that such a murder was premeditated. I am satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that her evil actions were playing out of her resentments arising out of her rejection by Mr. Price, her impending expulsion from Mr. Price's home, which he wanted to retain for his children. He added, the last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. In November 2001, Catherine was sentenced to life without parole and a notation, never to be released. Today, Catherine is serving her sentence at Malawa Women's Correction Center, Australia. Her children remained under the radar and wished to avoid publicity. Timothy Bleefnik, from Family Feud, contestant to wife murderer. Marriage is no joke. Some things are not joking matters, like marriages and relationships. In 2020, Timothy Bleefnik of Quincy, Illinois, appearing with family members on the television game show Family Feud, became infamous for his off-the-cuff, insulting answer on national television that appeared to indicate his regret over marrying his wife, Rebecca, who did not appear on the show. 
Although he laughed and joked about his answer, it appears that he was likely telling the truth. Beliefnik filed for divorce in 2021. Both he and his wife had temporary restraining orders against one another. On February 28, 2023, his wife's body was found by her father after she failed to pick up her children from school. Timothy and Rebecca, married since 2009, were estranged and living apart. She had been murdered, shot 14 times at close range. The murder came amidst a contentious divorce and fight over custody of their three young boys, ages 12, 10, and 6. Beliefnik told police he thought his wife was the victim of a violent home invasion. However, he was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of home invasion in June 2023. He was sentenced in August 2023 to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A slip of the tongue? What's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding? Host Steve Harvey asked Timothy Beliefnik during filming the game show Family Feud in 2020. Beliefnik replied, Honey, I love you, but said I do. Not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. I'm going to get in trouble for that, aren't I? Rebecca Beliefnik Rebecca Beliefnik, 41, was an award-winning nurse who, in 2020, received praise from the Daisy Foundation after assisting a woman whose husband was headed for emergency surgery with gangrene and sepsis. The woman had not been allowed to see her husband because of coronavirus restrictions, but before he was taken in for surgery, Rebecca made sure she got to see him. Rebecca was a certified trauma nurse and a sexual assault nurse examiner who worked as a traveling nurse during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. She also did volunteer work for an animal rescue group. Damaging Internet Searches During Timothy Beliefnik's trial in May, Quincy Police Detective Eric Cowick testified that the defendant's internet search history included the following. How to open my door with a crowbar. How to make a homemade pistol silencer. Can you wash off gunpowder residue? What is the average Quincy Police Department response time? Prosecutor said he attacked his estranged wife nine days after riding his bicycle to her house, where he spotted another man's car parked outside. Beliefnik went home and ran a check on the license plate of the man's car, ultimately learning that it belonged to someone his wife had been dating for several months. Ironically, his internet searches, which were his attempt to try to avoid detection by police, ended up being the most potent circumstantial evidence against him. Beliefnik arrested after shell casings found at his home. Beliefnik was arrested on March 13th, over two weeks after police had executed a search warrant at his home, where investigators recovered a number of shell casings matching those found at the scene of the murder. Rebecca's sister, Sarah Riley, testified during the trial that she received a text message from Rebecca that read, quote, If something ever happens to me, make sure the number one person of interest is Tim. I am putting this in writing, that I am fearful he will somehow harm me, come after me, or will try to do something to me that takes me away from the kids, or the kids away from me. He already has lied multiple times to paint himself as a victim, and me as the perpetrator, when it is absolutely the other way around." End quote. When autopsy photos of Rebecca's body were presented to court, Beliefnik appeared to wipe tears away. Beliefnik opted not to testify during the trial. He also did not present any witnesses or evidence. The divorce was continuous to say the least. The only way the defendant had to make sure that the three boys chose him over her was to eliminate her as a choice, said Josh Jones, Adams County Assistant State's Attorney. You researched this murder. You planned this murder. You practiced this murder. You broke into her house and you shot her. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen times. 
I don't know how long it took you to do that. Some of those shots were fired while she was laying on the ground, and you did all of that while your children were upstairs at your house, lying snug in their beds, said Judge Robert Adrian. Afterwards, Beliefnik was sentenced to two counts of first-degree murder and one count of home invasion in June 2023. He was sentenced in August 2023 to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Alex Ewing, how DNA identified the hammer killer. Alex Ewing, the hammer killer. In August 2021, forensic DNA testing connected Alex Christopher Ewing to four murders in January of 1984. Bruce and Deborah Bennett, their seven-year-old daughter Melissa, and Patricia Louise Smith. All three members of the Bennett family were beaten to death with a claw hammer, and Melissa was sexually molested. The Bennett's only daughter, three-year-old Vanessa, survived the savage beating she received. In 1990, Aura police officers sent three swatches from the comforter, as well as carpeting and other evidence to a forensic examiner in Richmond, California. In 2001, technicians were finally able to extract a DNA profile from both the comforter and carpeting taken from beneath Melissa's body. In 2018, Colorado Bureau of Investigation Director John Camper announced that authorities were able to obtain DNA from Ewing after changes in Nevada state law. Technicians used genetic genealogy to match the DNA sample to semen on the comforter in Melissa and Vanessa Bennett's bedroom, which ultimately became the smoking gun in the new murder cases. Hearing about the DNA match probably didn't mean much to Ewing, who was already serving a 110-year sentence in Nevada for attacking a couple in August of 1984. More on that in a minute. However, the sentence he was already serving might have eventually made him eligible for parole. Now there's no chance for that to happen. Ewing, the so-called hammer killer, will die in prison. How did Alex Ewing get caught? Roughly seven months after the Aurora incident, a couple in Henderson, Nevada, Nancy and Chris Berry, was subjected to an assault involving an axe handle but both survived the ordeal. In response, law enforcement initiated an extensive search effort involving both aerial and ground resources to locate Ewing. After a two-day search, he was apprehended and subsequently convicted in 1985. DNA linked Ewing to another violent crime. Investigators believe Jim Hobbins' child and his then-wife Kim Rice were the first in a string of attacks by Ewing. In January 1984, both were brutally assaulted by an unknown person with a hammer while they slept. Although the perpetrator managed to get away, DNA has since positively identified Ewing as the perpetrator of that crime. On that same day in Aura, Donna Holm arrived home after an evening grocery shopping trip only to be unexpectedly attacked in her garage by an assailant wielding a hammer. Sustaining a blow to her head that left her in a coma, she was later discovered in her bed by her boyfriend. The ensuing investigation confirmed that Donna had also been subjected to sexual assault. Donna, a 28-year-old flight attendant at the time, survived the attack but has no memory of the assault beyond the first blow from a hammer. Dixon suffered brain trauma. It took months for her to begin speaking again. When we first looked at it, we thought that it was likely that the killer was long gone, and we didn't have much hope then. But science and progress keeps marching on, said John Kellner, 18th Judicial District Attorney. The Hammer Killer Trials in his first trial, an Arapahoe County jury convicted Ewing of murdering three members of the Aurora family during the 1984 spree. He was sentenced to three life terms, but 
His attorneys triggered a mistrial after requesting that their client's mental competency be evaluated. During the retrial, Chief Deputy District Attorney Catherine Decker focused on the statistical certainty of semen and similarities to the Aurora case, working to establish Ewing's modus operandi. In both cases, the perpetrator entered through garage doors that were left open, murdered the victims with hammer strikes to the head, and sexually assaulted them. The defense team, led by public defender Catherine Powers Spengler, tried to poke holes in trace DNA and fingerprint evidence. But the jury in Ewing Jefferson County retrial once again found him guilty of three counts of murder. During sentencing, Vanessa Bennett, who was only three years old at the time of her attack, told the court how Ewing's violence affected her life. I didn't just lose my parents and my sister, she recalled. I lost the person who I was supposed to be. I lost my sanity. Before sentencing Ewing to three consecutive life sentences, Arapahoe County District Judge Darren Ball addressed the convicted killer. I have seen all kinds of evil and wickedness. Nothing compares to the level of depravity that your actions show in this case. There is no punishment that is too harsh for you, and I will do everything in my power to make sure you never draw a free breath ever again. Alex Ewing, 62, was not scheduled for a parole hearing until 2097. Prison records say he is incarcerated at the Northern Nevada Correctional Center in Carson City. Genetic Genealogy and DNA When confronted with the evidence that his DNA matched that found at the crime scenes, Ewing purportedly contended that there must have been an error. However, experts say that the chance of a random DNA match is anywhere from one in billions to even one in trillions, depending on the nature and quality of the sample. Advances in forensic technology allow investigators to cast a broader net, searching distant relatives of an unknown suspect. According to Chief Genetic Geonologist C.C. Moore, quote, Genetic genealogy is a major game changer for those cold cases because in a genetic genealogy database, we can reverse engineer the suspect's family tree from their distant cousins who have tested. So it doesn't matter that they haven't had their DNA tested through another arrest or crime scene. We don't need their DNA. We need somebody from their family to have tested in order to resolve these cases." End quote. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true crime cases. I'd like to give a very special shout-out to the reform members of the channel. Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Timmy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Knees. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Peace, love, and light to you all.